Hello everyone, I'm Justin Garrett and this is Launch Your Career. This is a new Microsoft Reactor show that we are beginning. Uh, it's going to be a 24 part series, uh, just exploring all the different types of job roles that one might consider here in tech. Uh, and just a quick reminder that we do have a code of conduct. Uh, please be nice, please be kind and considerate, of course. Uh, but most importantly, share your voice uh, in one of the chat windows that you have on our streaming platforms and such. So I'd like to begin with a very special guest, someone that I had on my first show this just in last year. Welcome, Sarah Young. Hi, Justin. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, it's great. To, it's great to have you. I think one of the you know conversations that we had last year about security was it was one of my favorite in the sense that I'm really passionate about the topic. It's an area uh, that is growing. It just continues to grow in terms of demand and opportunity and things like that. Uh, and so I wanted to kick off this new series with uh, with security as one of our our topics and such. So um, let's get to know you a little bit better, Sarah, to uh, begin. I always try to begin with sort of an icebreaker question or something like that. So the one mm -hmm. I picked for this one is, what is your favorite hacker movie or show? <gasps> okay, so it would have to be, I think I'm gonna give you, there's probably about three or four that most security people would tell you here, but I'm gonna go for War Games, which is a movie from the 80s. So well before most of the technology that we, that, that we now use was invented. Um, it's still very relevant though, go and watch it. Um, and of course, um, the second one would have to be Hackers, surprisingly. Um, yeah, there's. Um, but go and watch them. Um, also, if you're looking for something just as a tip, because I know you asked for one, but in terms of most technically accurate recently, uh, I think the general consensus in the security community is that the Mr. Robot series mm -hmm. is pretty technically accurate rather than just throwing random technical phrases in, which some other TV shows and movies have done. So I'm going War Games, classic, gets shown at a lot of hacker conventions. They often have movie night and they play these movies. So yeah, go watch it if you haven't. It's oldie, but a goodie. <laughs> nice. I think when I'm watching like hacker movies and things like that, I'm always intrigued by the UX design of what uh, mm -hmm. the hackers or the protagonists are using. And so like, it's like this very interesting UX and, you know, they type in send spike and then sort of magic happens and elevator doors open and, you know, yeah. chains will be able to come out of buildings that were otherwise completely secure and things like that. So I don't know a lot on whether that's plausible or not. I'm going to guess it's probably not. Um, <laughs> But from a US perspective, it's kind of cool, right? Yeah. Well, I happen to know that, you know, um, when a new sort of cyber focus series comes out, uh, you know, often in the security community, people will like, be like pausing the screen on the UX to read what it says yeah. to see if it's actually <laughs> accurate or it's just garbled things or random technical phrases, you know, and they say, the hacker has got into our IP address. I'm just going to reroute it through, through the encryption firewall. And everyone's like, they're technical words, but they don't mean anything. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously it sounds good and the, it's not really intent. It doesn't need to be technically accurate for you to get the point. But I know that in our community, <laughs> there are people who sit there and go through the UXs <laughs> and go and see how accurate it is. Totally. Well, it certainly is entertaining and it certainly in many cases, I think can be inspirational for, for people who are interested in pursuing uh, security careers and things like that too. Um, so before we get started and get to know you a little bit more, uh, walk through kind of a day in the life of a cybersecurity engineer, um, I want to just kind of let the whole uh, team and everyone know that we have a cloud skills challenge on this called Launch Your Career Skills. There's the URL there. Uh, but if you're interested in taking some of the technical skilling and learning about a career in cybersecurity, uh, you can check that out. It is a challenge, so you can kind of challenge yourself to collect all the different roles from the 24 job roles that we're going to be doing. But the first one here uh, is security as well. The other thing I wanted to share is a bit of a profile of the cybersecurity engineer. So on this first stream, I'm going to try this. We're going to see how people like it or not. I might get rid of it, I don't know, in the, in the future streams if it's not that interesting. But I, I went to LinkedIn and uh, learn.microsoft.com, Microsoft Learn and such, and tried to get kind of a sense at like, what is the demand and what is the interest for a career in security? 
Um, and so first of all, there's a ton of role variations that happen in security. And so you can check that out, everyone, on the left side mm -hmm. of the slide there. Um, but just because we're talking about a cybersecurity engineer doesn't mean that there aren't all these different roles, including the CISO, uh, Information Security Officer, and other people uh, that participate in what is otherwise a, a broad in industry as well. Uh, the other thing that I found was kind of interesting is that in just the past month here, there are 90,000 roles available in the United States alone around security engineer. And so you can kind of check that out on Career Explorer on LinkedIn. I thought it was pretty cool, especially, you know, in the past month and stuff. Um, and yeah, yeah. And sorry, are you going to say something, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I know you've just put the U.S. up there, but I can tell you that it, you, it may not be quite the same number just because uh, just because of the size of the different countries and stuff, but it is the same worldwide. There is a worldwide shortage in skilled cybersecurity professionals. So no matter where you are in the world, I, I am absolutely certain that, that you will see lots of job postings for security because all countries do not have enough people to fill the jobs. Um, so it's definitely an in-demand uh, specialty in yet yeah, everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit more about certifications. I think you've got some content on that later on, uh, Sarah, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but certainly, you know, you can check out the Microsoft Certified Azure Security Engineer Associate. Uh, I know I know that other cloud providers also provide certification in security as well. So there's really a lot to check out there in this exciting uh, area. So um, let's let's jump in a little bit more uh, to, to get to know you, Sarah, a little bit more as a security engineer. So um, let me just begin with like, what was that magic moment that made you kind of think, you know, I want to get into security and such? Okay, so for me, I didn't. So I started working in security about 10 years ago. Security wasn't cool then. You may have noticed in about, I'd say the last five, six years, security is now quite cool. Um, mm -hmm. and, and lots of people want to do it. Previously, security was kind of, they were like, oh, they're the ones that sit in the back and say no to things and weren't super popular. And it wasn't very trendy. It was a thing that needed to be done, but I wouldn't say it was a particularly cool bit of, of tech. But recently, that's really changed. Now, for me, um, I actually ended up in security by mistake. I, I can't say that I made a conscious choice to go into it. I actually moved countries and I took a new job in the new country with a new company. And they um, said that, um, and, and they were like, oh, um, when I got to that job, they told me I was going to be doing what I was doing before, which was network and infrastructure things. Um, and when I got there, they were like, oh yeah, we don't do that, but you're technical, right? And I was like, mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, go and help the security team then. And I remember even thinking at the time, oh, security, really? Mm, okay. Um, but when I started working in it, because that was the only work in that company on offer to me, I actually realized, hey, this is really interesting. And you can, I can use my tech skills. It seems that there's a lot more work and opportunity in, in uh, rather than what I was doing before that had a bit of a glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so I chose to stay in security. Uh, and and uh, I'm really glad I did. So for me, it wasn't a conscious choice. It was uh, a very fortunate unplanned, uh, unplanned thing that happened. Um, and of course, since then, the demand for security has grown. It's become quite a cool bit of tech to work in. Um, uh, but yeah, I can't say I, I consciously made the choice, but I did consciously make the choice to stay. So mm -hmm. uh, because it is a cool bit of tech to be in. Yeah, awesome. And I see some incredible uh, questions already in the in the chat window there, but uh, I'll paraphrase one of them and kind of say, you know, how do you think about, um, you mentioned the word technical, right? How do you think about coding workloads or technical skills as defined as like a ability to code? How does that kind of fit into the cybersecurity engineer and other cybersecurity yeah. roles? Yeah, so here's the thing. So it's really, um, security is huge because what well, us there's a couple of things we should probably like, clarify here. When we say security or cybersecurity, that's a huge umbrella of different yeah. roles. And um, that's a lot of specialties. And um, But what I do hear a lot is people will say, well, I can't code, so can I work in security? I will tell you, I cannot code. I can code a little bit, but no one wants me to code. I can promise you, nobody wants me to write some code. It's not my specialty. Now, there are certain types of jobs in security where you will need to know how to code, um, but there are many. I'd say there's, this is just Sarah, Sarah's uh, uh, just 
Sarah's non-scientific view, I'd say maybe 20, probably less than 20% of security jobs will require you to know how to code. That it's it's a it's a fairly like narrow specialty. Many, mm -hmm. many, many more jobs do not require you to know how to code in security. They don't even necessarily uh, require you to be technical. Um, now, I've actually put together, um, I've actually put together this uh, uh, slide deck because I get asked about this so much. Um, it's a slide deck that we can certainly, I don't know, Justin, if there's somewhere we can put it up. It's public. I'm it's not, there's nothing secret. I don't know yeah. if there's anywhere in Reactor land it can be posted afterwards um, for yeah. people to have a look in their own time. But this, um, I, I put this deck together, which is so you want to work in cybersecurity. And what I've done is I've put um, them in uh, the types of roles into five buckets. I don't know if we can, um, and I'll go through them just really quickly, just for time, but you know, feel free to look at them later. Um, I think uh, first one should be, um, did we go red teaming first? I think that's usually the one that people think of. Um, I don't know if we can move along in the slides a little bit. Yeah, so yeah sure. I was just posting. Uh, so I'm going to post this deck after our, our live stream <gasps> on tech communities. Yeah, so tech communities is just one of our new platforms at Microsoft where you can share your voice and comment and chat, everyone out there uh, and such. Yeah. And so it's a long link. I didn't do a link shortener on this particular one, <laughs> uh, but check it out in the chat window and I will post uh, yeah. uh, Sarah's deck afterwards. Uh, yeah. As well. Yeah. 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 Well, um, well, uh, I won't talk about whether you're, well, if you want to be a good cybersecurity person, there's a couple of things. I can see there's so many comments in the chat, by the way. I will try and go th through them as I'm talking, I promise. Um, I guess there's, um, and I'll try and, I'll try and address them as I go through the sort of the different buckets, but in general security, um, would you be a good fit? I mean, security changes a lot. You need to keep up to date. People are always trying to find new attacks. Um, it's certainly not the kind of career where you can sit and do the same thing for 15, 20 years because it's changing incredibly quickly and you need to keep up to date with that. Also, it's really, um, you know, you need to keep up your skills. Um, you need to be naturally inquisitive. Um, and I, I hate to throw out buzzwords, but you also need to, you know, um, there can be a lot of pressure in security. It does depend on your job as well. As I said, there are many jobs. Um, being critical and analytical, being logic is, is really important. Um, and something um, that I think is really important on here is can you translate technical speak into everyday language? That is a really important skill set that a lot of security people don't have. Because if I said to you, Justin, this is um, a CV10. Mm -hmm. We need to fix it. This We found a vulnerability in our web app. It's a 10 on the CVE scale. That's why it must be fixed, Mr. Siso. Can I have some money? Do you <laughs> understand what that means? Probably not. Not yet. No, exactly. Not yet. Not yet. But this is one of the problems security has not been good at. And so we, we definitely need more people who can do this. But if I said to you, Justin, this vulnerability in your web app that's going to go live tomorrow is uh, very easily exploited. Um, it's almost undoubtedly going to be exploited within a day at the most of being put online. And the consequences of that will cost the company tens of millions of dollars. Does that make that, more that sense would, in business that would get terms? My attention, right? That would get my exactly. Attention. And and one of the things security hasn't been very good at is being able to translate kind of what we understand in security into business speak. Because at the end of the day, something, and this is a rant we could go on, but uh, for a long time and we won't, but security is a function that serves an organization, whether you're a business or a not-for-profit or a government organization. And security cannot stop and must not stop that organization from doing what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. And so where it, and security people are not always very good at that. So having people who can speak security and speak business is also really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that kind of begs another question. I see some incredible questions coming in in the chat window. So again, I'll kind of paraphrase a little bit here, but um, maybe I'll, I'll just begin by saying like, can you help us explain, explain like, or can you help us understand the different hats that security professionals wear? So I hear, you know, white hat, black hat, I hear blue hat, yeah. red hat. Obviously some of these expressions carry a lot of connotations to them and things like that yeah, too. Yeah. So can you kind of level with us? Like, what is like, what is, what is the right way for us to think about it, talk about it? And then as we sort mm -hmm. that, 
then we'll get to things like pen testing and other things on the chat window as well. Yeah, so you're right. There's many colored hats. So what we normally say, and we're kind of moving away from that phrasing a little bit. Yeah. So you yeah. have black hats. Black hats are your um, offensive uh, um, testers. Uh, the black hats are the baddies because um, they're trying to break systems, but usually to, to do something bad, make money, steal data, whatever. Yeah. You have gray hats that sort of sit in the middle. Um, and then you have white hats, which are good hackers. So they're also trying to break systems, but they're typically being paid by a company to break the system, yeah. write a report on it so the company can fix it before a black hat comes along. What you hear when we're talking about security um, security jobs nowadays is more, we hear red teaming and blue teaming. Uh -huh. So the really? red teamers are, uh, they're the good, these are red teamers, they're all white hats, they're good guys. Um, but red teamers are the ones who are offensive security. So they are the penetration testers, people who are trying to break systems, but they're, but they're not bad. They're not going to do anything if they break the system. They're just going to tell you about it so you can fix it. Yeah. And then we have blue teamers who are defensive security. They're the people who are trying to put in controls to stop that the, the breach to begin with. So when people think about a security career, definitely I think um, the general public consciousness is more towards those red teaming roles, the people yeah. breaking systems. And that's what you see in the movies and, and, and TV and stuff. But in fact, it's not a huge proportion of security roles. It's, it's definitely a thing and they, those roles do exist, but as a proportion of the overall security landscape, there's a lot more blue teaming going on and a lot more jobs in that. I can tell you though, when I was early in security career, the red teaming seems very glamorous because you're there like, you know, you're going to break the system and blah, 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 blah. And it's, and it's very exciting. And I also used to want to do it. Uh, and then I realized there's actually a lot of other interesting security jobs as well. So what I would say to people is don't be sort of laser focus just on red teaming although it's very interesting and there's jobs you know there's a load of other cool jobs in security too awesome and some of the comments in the chat window are about penetration testing or pen testing mm -hmm. and things like that yeah. can you help us understand how that fits in the sort of the red hat and blue hat as well yeah so penetration testing is red teaming so for those yeah. of you who are not familiar with the phrase Penetration testing is when you pay, um, someone is paid um, either as a consultant or an employee of a company to go and effectively be an attacker. So they will be trying to exploit your system, get in, pull data from your system. Um, I used to work at a consultancy that did red teaming. So we would go in to uh, companies and they would say, you know, go at it, see, do your worst. And then we would write them a report saying all the things we had done. Um, often some of the, uh, the, the ultimate goal um, of a pen tester is to get domain admin because it's game mm -hmm. over if you get domain admin. Um, and But then um, using the report we would write saying what we did, how we did it, um, then the company can take that and go and fix it before a, re a bad external person who, who may be wanting to make money, use ransomware, um, that uh, can do it. So it is a, it is a defensive thing. Um, so it's, uh, and it's very interesting. Um, it's definitely, it's a very repetitive, very intense job um, mm -hmm. because effectively you're trying to, you're, you're testing a system, but you will test it again and again and again and again using tiny little variables to yeah. see if the system, because you're looking for tiny little cracks in it. Um, and so it's a very uh, specific skill set, very interesting. Um, uh, but I think it definitely takes a certain kind of personality. You have to be incredibly um, focused. Um, uh, you have to be very intense um, and very, very methodical. Um, now, knowing what I know about pen testing, I think I would get frustrated and bored. <laughs> I'm trying, you know, trying to break these systems, but definitely, you know, it's something that um, uh, certain people are really interested in. And, you know, it's, it's a very interesting role, but, um, you know, there's lots of other things out there, too. Yeah. And, and you speak to the, the diversity of people that we need in terms of roles in the security uh, industry and profession mm -hmm. itself, right? We need people who can think very systematically and make one variation to be able to adjust the system and, and, and find a weakness. Uh, but we also need other people who are, I, I think I saw in the chat comment and you mentioned it, 
uh, earlier, like assessing risk in some way, like deciding what to fix, what not to fix, where to invest mm -hmm. resources. So maybe help us understand like the opposite side, right? The the threat yeah. assessment elements of it, right? So, so that, that's a bit of security that a lot of people forget about. And we call it GRC or governance, risk and compliance. Now that is, and, and um, sometimes people are like, oh, that's the boring bit of security, but it's actually really important. So that is um, governance, risk and compliance folks. They are often the, the people who, um, they are writing policies. Um, so this is the documentation that says, when you build this system, don't do the following things, or you must do the following things. Um, someone needs to write that documentation. They write policies for internal companies. It can be for industries. It can be for government. Um, and also under there comes, um, sometimes comes auditing as well. Now, auditing can be, and in some businesses will have an internal audit function, usually bigger ones in more highly regulated industries. But you also have external audit as well, you know, co uh, companies that come in and do audits um, uh, as a consultancy. So um, both of those exist. I know someone was asking uh, some questions about that in the chat. Um, I mean, um, I won't go. Um, it's definitely an important thing. Um, it doesn't require as much technical knowledge as in hands on. You do need to conceptually understand the systems and know what you're looking for. Um, uh, but there are qualifications out there. Um, uh, ISACA, um, uh, which is I S A S I. Uh, I-S-A-C-A, -A. you can tell, I, I, I read the acronym, I know it, um, they will, um, they do a lot of uh, risk and audit and compliance certifications. Um, I've got all this on the, the PowerPoint slide that we'll put up, uh, the PowerPoint slides that I'll put up. Um, it's, um, and I know, uh, um, so uh, Synth fan said, I heard um, CISA is a good, is a good sir. Yep, CISA is one of them. <laughs> like, um, there's a couple of them out there. Um, also, look at um, some of the external consultancies, if that's the kind of role you're interested in. I think um, uh, all highly regulated industries like banks um, and government will sometimes have those sort of assessors as well. Ah, there. So this is, um, these are, this is the offensive security and red teaming one. Um, we'll, we'll skip back a bit. Um, so, um, oh, oh, is this one good? Uh, so we'll start here. Let's, um, I'll, I'll come back. Hopefully this is going to answer a lot of the questions, but feel free to type another question because we're getting lots of questions, which yeah. is let me, awesome. <laughs> let me just generalize it and say like, Sarah, yeah. tell us about the different types of certifications. There's at least three yeah. or four questions around certification. Yeah. And so I'll try to so, step through this as you speak to it. Yeah. So here we go. So. I, there's um, there's some general entry level learning, which is always good. I think something to bear in mind, which I think is a difficult thing for people starting off in security, and it's an acknowledged problem, is that often when we say it's an entry level security role, we don't mean it's entry level in career. Often a lot of people in security have already been working in IT for a number of years. Um, and uh, uh, that is changing a little bit, but I, I, I still hear a lot of people saying they have challenges around coming straight out of study into security because there is still um, a thought, not with everybody, but there is still a, a sort of mentality that you should go and work in another bit of IT before you come into security. I do think it's a really beneficial thing to do. I don't think it's the be all and end all is my personal opinion, but um, here on, up on the screen here are some, some general entry level learning uh, that's quite good. Microsoft does a fundamentals now. Uh, uh, there's also um, a lot of the industry bodies. Um, so ISACA, um, CompTIA, the certified in cybersecurity security comes from ISC squared, which is another big industry body. These are some good general entry level learning things to have a look at if you're just generally interested in cybersecurity. Um, if we can go to the, the next slide, I'll um, sort of talk about the more role specific things. So I talked about offensive security and, and red teaming. Um, now, this is an interesting one because uh, there's, there's, a, there's a side of the industry here who, who believe that for offensive security, qualifications are not required and that what you need to do is show what you've broken, <laughs> like what systems you've broken, uh, but you do need to learn how to do that somehow. So, um, I mean, as I said, the, the big daddy of red teaming certifications is the OSCP, the first bullet point there. Now I will say though, that is a hard certification. Even people who have been working in pen testing for a number of years will tell you that is a very hard qualification. Uh, but so, you know, probably as, as 
if you're looking to start offensive security, I probably wouldn't jump in at OSCP because, as I said, people who work in the profession say it's a really hard certification. However, if you're looking to learn the, those kind of offensive security skills, there are some really good courses out there. Hack the Box, Pen Tester Academy, there's a Web Security Academy. Go and look at the OWASP top 10. Uh, um, and uh, there's a lot of organizations that offer capture the flag exercises uh, where you basically go through a pre-built system and you're looking for the flags, but it's teaching you skills about how to wheedle your way through systems. Um, so that's kind of where I would look out for your red teaming piece. Moving on, uh, I think, uh, to security operations. This is close to my heart because it's something I worked in for a long time. Security operations is where we like detect and respond. Um, so most um, most uh, uh, people will have a, um, this. most people who do security operations will work in a security operations center or a SOC. Um, this is often a good place for entry level uh, uh, people to go in at. Um, if, uh, so we do have a Microsoft certification, which is SC200. Uh, which teaches you about how you can do security operations using Microsoft products. But more generally than that, there's also the GIAC um, Certified Incident, Incident Handler, GIAC Certified Forensic Examiner. And then because security operations often involves a lot of tooling, um, there's quite a few vendor specific certifications in this area as well. Um, so it, it does get quite specific here, but security operations, definitely, I've seen some questions about people saying, they, uh, how could they move into security? Um, I, I think if you come from like a system admin um, or a, a IT operations type role, this is a, a nice, easy way to transition uh, into security. This one makes sense here. Um, yeah, uh, architecture. So um, as you would expect, a security architect uh, is designing systems uh, or um, architects will design a system. The security architect will then review it, looking for it does, is, does it align with standards, uh, the industry standards and best practice? You know, is the system being designed in a secure way? Um, you see, again, it depends on the organization. You may see a more specific, like focused uh, uh, type of um, architect, it, you may see like a cloud security architect, or they may be more general. It does depend on the organization a little bit, but there's quite a few um, things here. Um, the one that people know a lot is the um, CISSP. That's uh, the Certified Information Systems Security Professional. That's mm -hmm. been around for a long time. Um, I will say it is a beefy exam. There is a lot of content. I have done this exam. Um, it, there's a lot of stuff to learn there. Um, and I've put some asterisks on there because some of these, um, you won't actually be given the certification until you've actually got five years worth of work experience. So I would say, you know, don't jump into doing these ones where you could take a lot of effort to do the exam, but they won't award you the certification. Um, uh, but we do have as well, Microsoft recently released um, a Microsoft Cybersecurity Architect exam, uh, the SC100. Um, and again, I've put vendor specific certifications on there because it will depend a little bit on the tooling you're using. Um, so again, um, you know, bear in mind, um, and of, of course, if you're um, if you're if you're coming from an architecture background more generally, of course, this is like a logical segue into security architecture specifically as well. So, you know, makes sense there. I and, think my next. Yeah, let me and let me I think we got a couple more there because we've got security yeah. engineering next. I also say and maybe just ask you a question, Sarah, on this as well is like mm -hmm. when you're thinking about all these different certifications, it feels like security is a very cert heavy role. What do you recommend first? Like, you know, where if you're yeah. just like trying out, you just want to learn a little yeah. bit more, is there a place yeah. you might begin? Yeah. So tell you what, I, and I give this advice to everybody. Um, don't spend a lot of your own money on certifications. Don't go and spend thousands and thousands on courses. I, I really don't think it's necessary when you're starting out in your career. There is so much cheap or free information online. And there's loads of online tutorials and videos. Um, I mean, and the exams that I've listed here in all of these slides, you know, there is a fee for them. Some of them are much more expensive than others, but um, there's some amazing learning channels out there, um, uh, which uh, the, 
you know, go and just search on YouTube. Um, for Microsoft, um, there's a gentleman called John Savile. He does loads of Azure learning things, not just security. Um, uh, there's a lady called Rana Cahill who does um, application security testing learning um, series as well. Like you can get a lot of learning without spending a lot of money. Wait until you're working um, and you've got that entry level role and hopefully someone else will pay for the expensive learning. Um, I, I, I really do um, wholeheartedly encourage you to not just throw money at more training. Um, like, you know, there's lots and lots of free stuff. Um, maybe you might want to go take some base level exams. So in Microsoft, the SC900, um, often Microsoft does deals on the exam certifications. And sometimes we give away you know, things away for free as well sometimes if you go to events. Um, but um, for example, the CISSP exam there, which is the second bullet point, I believe that costs about $1,000 to take the exam uh, from memory. So, you know, that's a lot of money. Um, and and so don't like be, be strategic. I, I genuinely don't think, um, and I'll come to this later on in the presentation about other things you can do. Um, certifications are not the be all and end all. I think um, they're an element of what can demonstrate you're interested um, in getting into something and that you're committed to learning, but I don't think it's the only way. So um, whilst we're talking through this, um, please, I, I don't want anyone to take away that is the only thing to do. There are many security people who have no certifications. I didn't get any security specific certifications until I was about four years into my cybersecurity career. So I don't want anyone to take away this was, you know, the be all and end all. No, I think, I think that's good advice. Uh, and I think one of the things I'm hearing from you, Sarah, is that you have just a wide range of options at your disposal, according to what you mm -hmm. want to explore. And, uh, you know, I think we at Microsoft, we've got uh, free learning on Microsoft Learn. So the, the modules, mm -hmm. Of the learning training elements uh, you can take for free. You don't have to pay for the exam. And as you mentioned, there's uh, discounts and other things that are run for, for certifications as well. In fact, if you happen to be a student, for example, you might want to check that out um, as well. So sounds great. Well, I want to make sure we make it through all the roles. So I think we got like two <laughs> yeah, yeah. more sets of, of, of general roles. And then I want to kind of ask you a little bit more about a day in the life um, as well. Sure. So security engineering. So, so many ones here. I mean, security engineering is super broad. It, it's really broad. I, I Probably I should narrow this down a little bit. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, security engineering people are probably implementing and building tools. They may be running the tools as well. Um, as you can see, there are loads of certifications that would be relevant here, depending on specifically what you're doing. Um, uh, but, you know, go and, again, still the same advice. Don't go spend loads, loads and loads of money. Use the free things out there or the cheap things to, to get yourself, um, you know, to get yourself up to speed. Um, but security engineering, it's, it's difficult one to pin down because different, you know, different, um, what I would advise you to do if engineering is where you want to go, have a look at a capability rather than a tool. So if you say, I'm really interested in posture management, go and look at all the posture management tools out there. In Microsoft land, our posture tool is Defender for Cloud, um, but there are other equivalent ones out there. So go and learn more generally about that capability rather than a specific tool, because that actually because that's what people will be looking for. Because when I'm, uh, you know, organizations won't necessarily expect you to have a specific tool knowledge mm -hmm. because, but because you know, tools are a variation on a theme, but they'll want you to understand a capability. So I think like when you're starting out, that's really important to, to sort of understand as well. I could go on about this forever, but yeah, let's. <laughs> and then we already talked about GRC, but it's up on the screen here. GRC are the folks who are managing security risks. Um, uh, they are the ones that often will talk to the business and say, hey, this risk here, this, this security vulnerability we have, this is what this means in business terms. And this is why we should care and how much it will cost to fix. And should we fix it? Should we not fix it? And they will present that to leadership or management and then they can make a call. Um, it's something traditionally we're not great at. <laughs> um, and so there, although some people say that's a boring job, it's all paper, it, you know, it's all paper stuff, it's boring. It's actually really important and we need you. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for sharing all of that. Uh, it's it's important and it's interesting to just kind of I think learn about 
uh, some of the just many different roles and, and functions there. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I was thinking a little bit more about like, um, how can this group of people kind of get to know uh, the, the profession a little bit more? And so I was thinking, uh, I've got to ask the AI question, you know, large scale models seem to be very popular right now, ChatGPT, OpenAI, some recent announcements with Microsoft there mm -hmm. that are, are exciting and things like that. So, you know, um, how do you think about AI and the role that AI can play in, in security in the coming years? So I think for me, um, there's this, oh, we, could talk, again, we could do another session on AI and security, <laughs> but I think that the, the, the most, the top of mind thing for me in security and AI is that AI, security, as we've already said, there's not enough security people. And even if everybody in the world who wanted a security job got one, we probably still wouldn't have enough people um, because there's so many systems are getting more complicated. We're getting more security signals and telemetry, which needs to be processed and analyzed. It is not possible for us to do that with yeah, people in yeah. the world. Microsoft can't do it. So Microsoft, approximately across all of our platforms, uh, Microsoft gets eight trillion signals a day, um, security signals. So that's logins, people trying to attack us, people prodding our things, um, all our different platforms. There is no way we could employ enough people to look at 8 trillion signals a day. It's just yeah. not possible. And yeah. so the thing that AI is really useful for um, and where I see it making some really helpful inroads in security is to help us process all that signal and turn it into something meaningful without having humans involved. The humans will just look at the output. Um, you'll hear, if you look at any sort of security tooling, not just Microsoft's nowadays, um, that you will see that everyone talks about their AI models, analyzing the data um, and, and helping with that. But it is really, really important. We have something called, um, it's a known phenomenon called alert fatigue, where mm -hmm. if you see the same alert every single time, people are just like, ah, whatever, 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 because your brain becomes almost numb to it. Um, and um, AI can help get rid of that alert fatigue. It will process it, hopefully get rid of a lot of false positives because we do get false positives mm -hmm. um, and then just allow the human to look at everything that's more meaningful. So I think that's the big thing that AI is going to help us with in security. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so then speaking of that tool set and such, like what are what are the types of tools or what are the things that you do on a on a day to day basis in the role? Yeah. Well, nowadays, because I'm a security advocate, I get to talk mm -hmm. about tools that I think people really need to use. <laughs> you so what my, you're doing right now. <laughs> so my current soapbox, apart from talking about careers, which is something I talk about a lot as well, um, is security hygiene. Now, this yes. is not ex super exciting. Um, uh, it's not all stopping the hack. Well, we are stopping hackers. We are stopping breaches. But security hygiene is really, really important. And by security hygiene, I mean configuring MFA, patching machines. Um, it's nothing exciting, it's nothing new. We've been telling people to do it for a long time, but still these things don't get done. And um, it, it is often the case, um, uh, Microsoft research shows that something like 95% of breaches would not happen if the security hygiene was good. Like mm -hmm. attackers don't go and make really complex attacks for for no reason, um, they don't. They don't make these really complex attacks um, uh, because it takes time, it takes effort. Why would a hacker spend loads of time making a really complex zero day exploit when you don't have MFA and they can just fish you? You know, mm -hmm. um, they will always use the easiest way to get what they want. And um, and and so, you know, and, and people don't do security hygiene right a lot of the time. Uh, and there's various different reasons. It can be time pressures. It can be a genuine mistake. You know, there's loads of reasons it happens. Not, it's very rare that someone sits there and is like, oh, I think I'll do this wrong. <laughs> um, you, know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's not that, but it does happen. So um, we have cloud security um, posture management tooling. Um, and in Microsoft uh, environment, that's Defender for Cloud. What it will do, it will look across all your services and say, hey, here, you don't have a patch machine. You don't have um, you don't have MFA configured. Um, you should do that. And it can actually help you automatically do it as well um, if you want to. And that automation piece is also really uh, important and critical because, again, our environments are getting so big and complex, 
no one can manually go through and fix these things. We need tools to automate it and do it for us. So I think um, looking at that is really important and also making sure it's consistent across all your environments because um, Microsoft Defender for Cloud isn't just for Azure, it's for on-prem, it's for AWS, it's for GCP, it's for other clouds, because there is no point securing one part of your yeah, environment. Yeah. You should be, like, if you secure just your Microsoft stuff and nothing else, well, there's, there's not really any point. So that interoperability piece is something I'm talking about a lot at the moment, because I think that, that everybody knew that you need to secure everything, but I think the understanding and what that means and understanding how to do it is becoming more into our forefront of mind and consciousness. And if you look at Microsoft things, you'll definitely um, you'll definitely hear, you know, a lot of people talking about that. You know, how do we do it end to end with everything? Yeah. Because there's no point if we're not doing it with everything nearly. Yeah, I like how uh, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, it's a multi, multi-cloud, multi-device mm -hmm. product and things like that. And I mean, to your point, um, you know, phishing attacks and things like that are getting more sophisticated. We talked a little bit about this on on the show last year with this just in uh, as well. And, and so multi-factor authentication can be a safeguard even for the most well-intentioned people. I'll I'll even tell the story by myself. I've, I've always prided myself at being a, I can spot that fish uh, pretty easily. Mm -hmm. I think we even did like a find the fish last time and things like that too. Um, but I, I'll admit there was one, one in my whole career where I looked at it and I was like, that looked like I was just, you know, I was burning through a hundred emails in an hour on a work day. And all of a sudden there was one that looked pretty, like it looked like it was a legit work email and it wasn't. Um, unfortunately, you know, multi-factor authentication is something that can protect against that, uh, that type of scenario or something. And so yeah. you got to protect against that human factor or the Justin factor in this particular case. Um, yeah. Well. I got one recently. I got one recently as well that was very convincing. And I, now I clicked on the link, but luckily then it wanted to put my card details in and I twigged it. With yeah, that. wait a second. I, yeah. I clicked on the link and I was annoyed with myself because it was a very good one. Very good. And it wasn't picked up as a, with a spam flag either. Yeah, yeah. Um, they are getting better. They are. And I like to think I can spot them too, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rebecca on the chat window has a really great question around this. Is security hygiene the same as vulnerability management? Maybe help us understand what's, what's yeah. vulnerability management because that's a little bit. Oh, so vulnerability right? management is um, when we look, uh, you have tools that are vulnerability management tools. And what they do is they scan your infrastructure and they look for, they're looking for if there's any inherent vulnerabilities in like the OS you're running or, or the hardware. Um, now, and then the idea is you fix them if you can. Um, now, vulnerability management and security hygiene are um, vulnerability management is a certain bit of security hygiene um, because vulnerability management is usually uh, can sometimes you can fix it sometimes you can't um, so um, if it's a vulnerability that's because you haven't patched um, and you should fix it so it is a part of security hygiene quite a specific bit but security hygiene is um, wider than that because it also covers misconfiguration. But you're right, Rebecca, um, it's definitely part of it. So you're definitely on the right track with that. Um, but, um, and it's really important. It's so important. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And uh, uh, I was just thinking about also, like when you think about the next five years in this, mm -hmm. um, in this industry and such, I think last year we talked about a passwordless future. And that was something that Microsoft uh, has a strong perspective mm -hmm. on and is pursuing to where are we where are we with password lists where are we in the next where do you think we'll yeah. be in the next five years I'd like to think we're we'll be a lot further along there are challenges around it um because yeah. password list is great and you know we use it in Microsoft um I try and use it everywhere that offers it um there's a couple of challenges to slow more general adoption which uh and in in organizations tends to be your user base more than anything because yeah. um depending on in Microsoft right you know most of the people who work for Microsoft are fairly technical, um, you know, no matter what role you're in, or at least have an appreciation for tech. Mm -hmm. um, we do hear from customers that they're like, oh, we would love to do the password list, but either it's too expensive um, because it does require um, 
a certain level of hardware, as in, you know, if you want to use Windows Hello, you need to have uh, a, a webcam that supports Windows Hello in your laptop. Yeah. Not every organization will have that. And of course, to replace things costs money. But it might also to be do with their user base as well. They might say, oh, our user base doesn't understand this. Um, you know, they don't want to do it. It's too much hassle. We do hear that as well. Now, um, you know, as time goes on um, and, uh, you know, the general uplift of uh, of uh, the general life cycle of IT as things get modernized um, for every business, I think we'll see passwordless, you know, get more adopted just by default. But I, I don't think, you know, in five years, we'll be 100% there. But as with most technology that we adopt, um, you know, you've got your kind of uh, front runners that adopt quickly, you've got the majority that do it at a certain pace. And then the other ones, um, there's always like a, a proportion of organizations that do it right at the end because they've got challenges for whatever reason. But it gets to the point where it's almost unusable what they've got. And so they are forced to upgrade. Um, I think passwordless won't be there for a little while, but, you know, it, it'll happen for sure. And I think we'll be in a much better place because passwords have been proven to not be great. And it's not because the concept isn't great. It's because people aren't great um, at remembering passwords and people use the same thing. It's actually a limitation like human brains more than anything. So, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, so well, we're about 45 minutes into the stream. So y'all out there, please type any other questions you have for Sarah in the chat window. Uh, I've tried my best in the chat window to summarize some of the earlier ones. But if I missed any, please feel free to uh, uh, to, to type in the chat window as mentioned. Um, in the meantime, uh, if you're interested in taking our Cloud Skills Challenge and learning more technical skills, uh, you've got the URL there. It's aka.ms slash launch your career skills. Also, uh, myself and Sarah, we have our own social feeds and LinkedIn and Twitter and things if you want to check, um, check that out uh, as well. And then finally, uh, this is just the beginning of 24 episodes, I think, and I hope uh, in the next uh, uh, coming months and things like that. And so you can check out the entire series that we're going to do on this. Uh, at aka.ms launch your career uh, as well. And in fact, we're going to air this episode tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific and uh, will be available uh, and other security professionals will be available uh, for live chat. So we're going to pre-record, we're going to air this pre-record that we did right now, uh, but we'll be available live uh, for chat uh, as well. Try to be a little more inclusive to people in time zones that are other than this right now mm -hmm. as well. So that's our uh, that's our intro there, and let's see if we can take uh, some questions here. Oh, oh there um, is one there, Justin, that I definitely want to take because that's yes, a really please, good yeah. question. If you don't mind me like taking over, yeah. No, so okay, um, sure. there is a question there of the tens of thousands of open cyber jobs. Roughly, what percentage are entry level? I don't see many now. Yes, um, there. As I, I I mentioned this earlier on we have a problem in security is that we need entry level people but entry level into security does not mean entry level into it um and often uh, what people will see um is they say this is an entry level role but you need five years experience um and then so people are like well what does that mean <laughs> like i you know that that doesn't make any sense um and it doesn't um um it's it's really tricky um now i am um, the best way, and, and this is what I kind of wanted to end on, and it's in my slide deck as well. Um, I think it, it's really tricky. Um, it's 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 frustrating. As, as someone who's trying to get into security, I can really understand the frustration that many people have here. Um, I would say um, if you're interested in security, but you're just completely starting out in your career, apply for entry-level security roles, but also apply for other IT things. It may be that you need to do a couple of years in IT and use it as a stepping stone. Um, don't, don't just sort of completely focus on security. It is frustrating that there's not um, a lot of entry-level stuff. But what I would also encourage you to do, aside from looking at these certifications and teaching yourself is network. Network like as much as you can. The great thing about the security community is there's loads of community events. Um, look up community security events, look at meetups, look at the community conferences like B-Sides, um, and there are other ones out there too. Um, meetups are generally free to attend, and community conferences often will give cheap tickets to students and people who are looking for jobs. They may even do it for free. I know some of the B-Sides events I've been to, they have a uh, resume, um, CV, reviews. Um, and, and so they will help you look. And it's a great way to make connections. Because I can tell you, some of the best jobs I've got is 
um, or heard about is just through talking to people. Often by the time uh, a often by the time a job goes up on LinkedIn, you know, um, it goes up on LinkedIn or it goes up on a job board because that's what the company has to do. The manager may have already got some people in mind. Um, you know, if you're already in working, reach out to, uh, and you want to move into security, reach out to people who work in security at your organization or your local security chapter. Go and talk to them and say, hey, do you have advice? Oh, I just want you to know that if you have any um, roles coming up, I'm looking to move into security. Get your face out there. It sounds cheesy, and I know not everyone's comfortable doing it. I know I certainly wasn't uh, earlier on in career, but it's so, so, so important. It, it really, really is. And But again, it doesn't have to cost you lots of money. I can assure you that community conferences are, A, way more fun, B, far more interesting, and C, you get to talk to lots more commercials that are more about selling products. So if you can't afford to go to Black Hat, if you can't afford to go to RSA, don't stress. Find your local community conference and go there. Really, it will be far better for your career. It will cost you a fraction of the cost, if anything. And uh, this is what I encourage everybody to do. Um, it's it's really, really important. Don't just focus on those certs. Do them, but but there are other things you need to do to get out there. Um, and you know, it, you know, it, you know, get a card, go and talk to someone, say, hey, you know, I'm looking for jobs. It's so 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 important. And it, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, there are security communities everywhere. I would be really surprised if there's somewhere in the world where you can't find a community that that you can connect to locally so that would be my my main bit of advice for people awesome appreciate that um yeah so the other question i think i saw was uh someone was also asking about uh whether you need a degree uh you know a traditional university degree for security well i've well i have a degree my degree is in history so there you go um <laughs> do you <laughs> Do you need a degree? No. Um, I'll tell you what a degree, if, if you're studying or you're choosing a degree, I think that's great. I mean, there are lots of good computer science, cybersecurity degrees out there. So go and do one. Is it the end of the world if you don't have one? No, it really isn't. Um, what it will do, um, right at the beginning of your career, what you may find though, is it may um, sort of limit some of the roles you're applying for. So if you're looking for graduate training programs at big well-known companies, often they will say, you know, we are looking for a technical degree um, and that might discount you. I can tell you, speaking from my own experience, the graduate program I went on, I went on specifically because they didn't care what degree I had, because a lot of the ones I looked at and wanted to apply to wanted a technical degree. And so early in my career, um, it can be difficult to demonstrate other things because you're early in career. And so it can be a little bit of a barrier in certain areas, but it's not. It will just change how you approach things. I wouldn't stress about it. If um, there are plenty of companies that take people without a specific degree, and there are plenty of companies that will take someone with no degree as well. Um, I think, um, again, you will probably have to work harder in to that in, for that initial first step. I would definitely not be turning down Oh for, oh, for context as well, I did help desk for 18 months before I got a graduate role. So I took a very entry level role because that's just what I needed to do. So, um, you know, think don't always think that, you know, your first job has to be a I'm an entry level security person. You know, look at the long game. What role could you get that is a stepping stone to where you want to be? And I think that we don't talk about we always talk about you must immediately go into a role that is security that you want. Whereas in fact, to be more pragmatic sometimes, um, you know, go and get a help desk role, go and get a systems admin role. You know, you can use that to take to the next step to get you where you want to be. It's a journey. You don't have to be there straight away. Yeah. And I very much agree with that. Uh, I was a business major and also f uh, studied political science and economics, but I was a web developer uh, in my internship, my first internship during during college. And so I learned the technical track and I learned a lot of things through consulting and through working with people in Microsoft and things like that, and tech, including technical skills. And so I think if it's, it's something that you are actively pursuing right now or considering, it's, it's good to have the degree, but uh, there are so many resources that are out there. And so if you're just trying to decide what you want to do, including being a security engineer or other security roles, 
Uh, there's so many resources there to learn uh, to steer you in the right direction as well. There is, uh, there is. Yeah. And be persistent. Try not to take, you'll get rejected. I've been rejected many times. Um, and again, I think, well, this is more general advice, you know, and it, with time, you get better at being you know, resilient to these things. It's often not personal at all. Um, so don't be disheartened. Keep going. Um, you will get there. Yeah. I like Crypto Uni's comment there. Number one skill for info, InfoSec, resilience. Uh, so uh, yeah. so very true. And maybe uh, maybe that's a microcosm of the tech a tech career and, and in the tech industry uh, in general, as, as many of us have had many different roles throughout our careers uh, in route mm -hmm. to where we are uh, as well. So I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Uh, again, uh, thank you all for attending, for learning with us. Sarah, thank you so much for being our first guest on our first episode here. Really learned a lot uh, from you as well. And for all of you out there, again, if you want to take the Cloud Skills Challenge, you have the link there or other episodes you can catch uh, next week uh, as well. We're going to be focusing on data analyst uh, and analytics manager as our next topic as well. So thank you all and have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.